Hello, and thank you for joining us for the latest talk in the Australian War Memorial's History Webinar Series. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. My name is Megan Adams, and I'm a historian in the Military History section here at the Australian War Memorial. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. David Sutton, who joined the Military History section at the Memorial in 2017. Dr. Sutton specialises in the Second World War and Australian peacekeeping operations. He has published widely on the Second World War, including his most recent book, Syria and Lebanon, 1941, The Allied Fight Against the Vichy French. He is currently working as a senior historian and concept developer for the Memorial's new peacekeeping galleries. I'll pass over to you, David. Thanks, Megan. It's great to speak to you. Just before first light on the 17th of January, 1993, soldiers of two platoon, Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, readied themselves to take to the streets of Baidoa, a medium-sized city in south-central Somalia. They were serving in Operation Solace, Australia's contribution to the Unified Task Force, a US-led peace enforcement operation conducted to bring much needed humanitarian aid and security to a country racked by decades of war. Lieutenant Bob Warswick later wrote of the patrol, the first impressions of the town in the morning were completely different to what was expected. As you left the main gate for the first time and allowed the action of your rifle to chamber a live round, the reality of the situation suddenly hit you. Everything you had trained for was now, and outside was the unknown, the first operational patrol since Vietnam. The effect on the soldiers was overwhelming. Eyes widened, trying to see into the morning darkness, ears were pricked up, Heads cocked, listening for the slightest sound, but hearing nothing but your heart pounding, hands tightening on pistol grips, and sweat pouring from every pore as the soldier's instinct took over and they became switched on. We'd only gone 20 metres outside the gate. There were three hours and another 12 kilometres ahead. Some 1,500 Australians served in Somalia between 1992 and 1995, and no two experiences were alike. But for many of the Australian infantry who deployed to Somalia in late 1992 and 1993, such patrols were in many ways the defining feature of UNITAF. This talk will explore the history behind Australia's peacekeeping operations in Somalia, give context to those patrols, and discuss the many roles performed by Australians to bring some hope to a region in desperate need of assistance. So for some background, since gaining independence from Italy in the north and Britain in the south, and combining as the newly independent Somali Republic in 1960, Somalia had endured decades, endured decades of political instability, brutal military dictatorship, famine and war. More than 70% of the population of the capital Mogadishu lived in slums and squatter camps. Despite the fact that liter illiteracy rates were high, Somalia was spending as much as five times on the military as it was on health and education. Many of the problems that plagued Somalia in the second half of the 20th century stem from the legacies of European colonialism, which disrupted traditional clan structures and upset the balance of power. When European powers drew lines on a map to create African colonies in the 19th century, they did not take into account the ethnic makeup of those territories. The Somalis were one of the most homogenous ethnic groups of Africa, but when the new republic was created, millions of Somalis were living as minorities in neighbouring countries, including some 2.5 million ethnic Somalis living in the Ogaden region of Somalia's great traditional rival, Ethiopia. This would be a major cause of a devastating war between Somalia and Ethiopia in the 1970s, a war that, among other things, would lead to the displacement of more than, more than 1 million people and the creation of a vast refugee crisis on the Somalia-Ethiopia border. In 1992, the country yet again descended into civil war, when four competing warlords vied for power in the vacuum left after the overthrow of the military dictator Mohamed Siad Ba. The combined effects of a civil war, anarchy and a prolonged drought led to an estimated 2 million people becoming internally displaced persons, or IDPs, in Somalia, and refugees in Kenya, Ethiopia and Djibouti. They concentrated around wells and rivers, where aid organisations had set up camps to distribute food and other supplies. By July 1992, more than two million Somalis relied on the provision of food, water and medical services by the UN and other aid agencies. In short, by the early 1990s, Somalia was the home to a massive, man-made humanitarian crisis. Millions were starving, 
and millions more, so recently rid of one dictator, Mohammed Siad Bar, now had to deal with four would-be dictators, Ali Mahdi Mohammed, Mohammed Farah Aidid, Mohammed Saeed Herzi Morgan, and Omar Jess. These warlords were willing to allow hundreds of thousands to die to achieve their aims, and traditional clan rivalries became the basis by which bandits looted and hoarded food from others. UN aid agencies had been heavily involved in Somalia since early 1991, but it was increasingly difficult and dangerous to distribute that aid. From December 1991, the UN began to seek a resolution to the war and to the humanitarian disaster. After initial reluctance for the warlords to for foreign intervention to occur, UN negotiations, made with the help of the Organisation of African Unity and the League of Arab States, eventually led the dominant warlords to agree to a ceasefire and the deployment of UN personnel. The UN Security Council subsequently authorised the establishment of the United Nations Operation in Somalia, or UNISOM, on the 24th of April 1992, and it began to deploy from July of that year. It originally comprised 50 military observers from 10 countries and was later expanded to include a 500-strong Pakistani inf infantry security force. UNISOM faced the daunting tasks of monitoring a shaky or non-existent ceasefire, providing security for the distribution of humanitarian aid with insufficient troop numbers, and facilitating discussions among warlords who had little interest in achieving peace. The Australian Defence Force was at first not involved in UNISOM, but as the mission expanded to include 3,500 international troops and 700 logistic personnel, Australia agreed to provide a 30-strong movement control unit to assist. The Australian deployment to UNISOM, designated Operation Iguana, initially consisted of 30 personnel drawn from the Army, Navy and Air Force, under command of Major Greg Jackson. Their job was to coordinate the movement of personnel and supplies for the international peacekeeping effort. The main bulk of the Australian Movement Control Unit began to arrive in Mogadishu from late October 1992, but it took a long time, uh, not until January 1993, for it to reach full strength. When they arrived in Mogadishu, the city remained a dangerous war zone. Upon first arrival, Australians were advised not to bother wearing seatbelts because they might prevent a quick getaway in the event of an ambush. The Australians serving in this early operation were frequently exposed to dangers such as being caught in firefights between rival Somali factions. They lived in a house overlooking the airfield in Spartan conditions, no refrigeration, generators or transport, and unreliable lighting and communications. Despite the best efforts of those on the ground, it was soon clear that the increasing violence in Somalia was becoming unsustainable, and that the 500-strong Pakistani battalion was not big enough to provide adequate security. In response, in November 1992, the United States announced that it would lead, be ready to lead and command a peacekeeping force to bring a swift resolution to the escalating crisis. The new force, which would be US, not UN-led, though it was endorsed by the UN, would be called the Unified Task Force, or UNITAF. UNITAF's mission was to provide a secure environment for the distribution of humanitarian aid as soon as possible. It was entering into a civil war in a country with no effective government. It was a clear example of peacemaking or peace enforcement rather than more traditional peacekeeping. Traditionally, in peacekeeping, usually UN troops supervise a ceasefire agreed to by competing governments or warring factions. In peacemaking or peace enforcement, the shaky ceasefire, if existing at all, requires a more robust military response to be enforced. The troops are not so much preventing the re-escalation of conflict as using military force to try and stop the conflict in the first place. On the 9th of December 1992, some 1,800 US Marines landed at Mogadishu without facing opposition. They were the first elements of a force that would eventually build up to about 28,000 US troops, supported by 17,000 troops from 23 other countries. The Australians of the UNISOM Movement Control Unit, who were in Mogadishu at the time, watched the initial US landing from the roof of their accommodation, flying a boxing kangaroo flag to try and show that they were friendly. They were armed with just three AK-47s borrowed from the Pakistanis because they had no other means of defence. Things in Mogadishu were about to get very different. As soon as UNITAF was announced, there was recognition in Australia that we would almost certainly be making a large contribution because of our alliance with the US. And after much discussion, it was decided that Australia would make a sizeable contribution to UNITAF and would continue to contribute to UNISOM as well. Australia's main contribution to UNITAF 
would be through the deployment of a nearly 1,000 strong battalion group based around 1st Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, or 1RAR. The 1RAR Battalion Group, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel David Hurley, consisted of the four rifle companies of 1RAR, as well as armoured personnel carriers and other units. Integral to the success of Operation Solace was the contributions of HMAS Tobruk and HMAS Jarvis Bay, which were selected to accompany the operation. HMAS Jarvis Bay would take supplies to Somalia and return to Australia. HMAS Tobruk delivered 75 troops and 846 tonnes of cargo, including 21 armoured personnel carriers and 45 trucks and other vehicles at the start of the operation. They then remained in African waters, where it, among other things, delivered supplies from Mombasa, Kenya. HMAS Tobruk's central role in Operation Solace, as the operation was known, was made all the more impressive given that when it was announced that Tobruk was going to Somalia, it was literally in pieces in a refit at Garden Island in Sydney Harbour. Navy personnel worked extremely hard at breakneck speed to get it ready to go. This included hanging a large banner to the, banner to the guardrails that read, Bound for Somalia, to explain to the local residents of Woolamaloo why the ship was bathed in bright light throughout the night and why there was so much noise 24 hours a day. When it sailed from Sydney on the 26th of December 1992, it was escorted out of the harbour by hundreds of craft taking part in the Sydney to Hobart yacht race, which formed a guard of honour. Australia's main contribution to UNITAF was its control of an area of Somalia known as Bay, an agricultural region based around the town of Baidoa. Technically, they operated in what was known as the Baidoa Humanitarian Relief Sector, one of eight humanitarian relief sectors in southern Somalia run by various contributors to UNITAF. At the time of UNITAF's deployment, Baidoa was the epicentre for starvation in Somalia and had been dubbed by the media as the City of Death. Baidoa, in December 1992, had a population of about 200,000, with thousands of refugees living on the outskirts of town or in the streets. They were preyed upon by criminals and visiting bandits. The city and surrounding countryside was effectively lawless. Despite the tireless efforts of the many international non-government organisations that were already in the region, thousands were affected by starvation. Bandits and criminals stole much needed food to sell on the black market. The same bandits raided villages, stole property and livestock, ambushed vehicles, assaulted women and extorted cash from desperate locals. Every night, Local hospitals run by International Medical Corps and Medicine Sans Frontières treated scores of Somalis for gunshot wounds and injuries received in beatings. Community volunteers picked up and buried around 100 bodies a day. Lieutenant Colonel David Hurley, the commander of the 1RAR Battalion Group, arrived with his advance party in Baidoa on the 11th of January and set about establishing the Australian base at the airfield. The rest of the 1RAR Battalion Group had finished arriving in Baidoa by the 22nd of January. Hurley and his staff soon recognised that they needed to undertake four simultaneous tasks in order to fulfil their mission, and these formed the core of the main operations undertaken by the Australians in the Baidoa region for the 17-week long deployment. First and foremost, they needed to protect the battalion base, so a key role for the Australians was to man checkpoints and provide security on that front. Second was to create a secure environment in Baidoa to protect humanitarian operations. Food could not be effectively distributed if the security situation remained as dire as it was so creating and maintaining a presence was necessary to disrupt criminal patterns and allow for food to get where it was needed most. Key to this was working with the non-government organisations already in the city to assist them to do their vital work. Third, the Australians needed to maintain sufficient presence in the surrounding countryside to deter anyone contemplating interfering with the distribution of humanitarian aid. Similar to the method adopted in Baidoa itself, it was essential to have enough of an impact in the countryside to deter bandits and corrupt and disrupt criminal activity. Last, the Australians recognised that they would need to provide close protection for food convoys and other humanitarian activities in also in the countryside. This was to ensure that the food that was making it out of Baidoa was getting to where people actually needed it. There were in essence four main tasks required of the 1RAR battalion group and the four rifle companies in the battalion with which to fulfil that role. Hurley and his staff assigned each of the companies, along with reconnaissance, mortar and direct fire support, to each of the key tasks, and they would rotate between them on a nine-day basis. This meant that each company rotated through a variety of tasks and gained valuable experience. It also meant that, except when providing guard duties for the battalion base, which was by no means an easy or safe option while on deployment, 
one of the key tasks for Australians was to be out beyond the wire and on patrol, either in Baidoa itself or in the surrounding countryside. Australians conducted frequent, long and gruelling patrols throughout their deployment to UNITAF. Lieutenant Bob Warswick, who I quoted at the beginning of the talk, later wrote how, quote, the first patrols were marathons. Dressed in flak jacket and helmet, the soldiers had to walk one kilometre before they left the perimeter of the airfield, then cover 12 to 15 kilometres in temperatures in excess of 40 degrees Celsius. To sleep after a patrol was near impossible. The effects were noticeable after a day and blatant after two. For a commander, it was awe-inspiring. The men were physically wrecked, eyes reddened from lack of sleep, yet the moment they left the gate, they switched on, alert to the slightest noise or movement." End quote. When the Australians made their first forays out of Baidoa into regional centres such as Berhakaba, they faced similar conditions, but the infantry and those supporting them, along with other elements, were able to provide the necessary security and establish the UNITAF presence. At the same time that the Australians were establishing their presence in Baidoa and urban centres such as Berhakaba, they were protecting food convoys travelling across the Baidoa humanitarian relief sector. The Australians would light, ride shotgun in trucks and then ensure the supplies were distributed in an equitable and orderly way once at their destination. A key problem identified early on was that often, once food had been distributed, bandits and other criminals would come and take the food for their own use to sell on the black market. The Australians had the choice of sticking with the security element of their mission and not interfering with the distribution of aid once it had been dropped off or doing something to help with that equitable distribution. Hurley and his commanders eventually decided that despite the additional dangers, they would still choose that path of intervention. From late January, the Australians began to double back on aid distribution points after 20 minutes to confront the criminals, and this doubling back technique proved successful and was used widely. The Australian success in protecting aid convoys throughout the countryside had its effect in urban centres, where bandit groups became increasingly desperate and violent in their attacks on aid compounds. The aid groups did what they could, but part of the problem was that local security guards they employed were more often than not bandits themselves who used their positions to steal supplies from their employers. As violence increased, Hurley decided that an appropriate response would be for Australian troops to stop conducting patrols from the relative safety of the Australian base, where their movements could be easily monitored by hostile locals, and instead to occupy several non-government organisation compounds 24 hours a day and use them as a base for their patrols. This change would help protect aid agency staff and their compounds from local criminals, and even from their own guards. The change put the Australians in increased danger. The first danger was the untrusty, untrustworthy NGO guards. The second was the grenades frequently lobbed over walls and wires of compounds. Like the non-government organisation managers, the Australians were now putting their, their bodies on the line 24 hours a day. But by launching patrols from compounds, the Australians achieved an extra element of surprise and stealth, and this helped deter local bandits. The patrols led to an increase in engagement between Australians and the bandits, and Australians regularly engaged in firefights with hostile elements while on patrol. A huge problem that faced the Baidoa humanitarian relief sector at the time, and one of the key barriers to restoration of security, was the huge numbers of weapons that flooded the local community. UNITAF had a mandate to, quote, create a secure environment, end quote, in Somalia, but there was some disagreement between the US and the UN about how to interpret this phrase. US Secretary General, UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali took this to mean that they would disarm the clan armies, thereby reducing the ability to fight among themselves, harass aid agencies and intimidate UNISOM troops. The US stressed that the point of Operation Restore Hope, their codename for UNITAF, was for it to be a quick mission to facilitate the distribution of humanitarian aid only. The US feared that if they gave their forces the task of disarming the clans as well, they'd be drawn into a long, bloody and costly conflict. The Australian government supported the UN position. For Australia, if UNISOM was to be successful, some effort would need to be made to disarm the warring factions. Once in Baidoa, Hurley implemented a policy of confiscating arms and ammunition, according to this interpretation. This weapons confiscation policy, however, caused some anger with local Somalis and aid agencies. Many of the NGOs employed armed locals and, as security and felt they needed to keep the weapons to protect staff and property. From the Australian perspective, they could not know who was a guard and who was not, and they knew that from the briefings that it was entirely likely that a guard one day would be a bandit the next. Similarly, almost every Somali household and business owned a weapon of some kind for protection. 
The original policy to confiscate all weapons was unworkable, so eventually Hurley established a weapons registration policy for NGO guards and allowed them to carry their weapons in compounds. Australian personnel collected thousands of weapons during their deployment, a number of which are now in the, in the collection of the Australian War Memorial. Alongside the dizzying array of real weapons removed from the community, the Australians also confiscated fake weapons. These fakes, some of which go to remarkable detail to try and look like the real thing, were a real problem for Australians on patrol. In low light, with adrenaline pumping, the Australians could easily mistake a child holding a fake weapon for a bandit with the real thing, and accidentally shooting someone could have devastating consequences for the work being done by the Australians to build goodwill and restore security with the local community. The Australian method of weapons control and confiscation in Somalia was considered the exemplar for the international peacekeeping operations in Somalia at the time. In early April, Australia's UNITAF deployment was marked by tragedy. On the 2nd of April 1993, Delta Company, 1st Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, set out from their compound to conduct a routine night patrol of Baidoa. Among the company was Lance Corporal Shannon McElhaney of Ballina, New South Wales. As the unit left for patrol, he was accidentally shot by an unauthorised discharge at point blank range. McElhaney was evacuated to the armoured personnel carrier, by armoured personnel carrier to the treatment section at the Baidoa airfield, but died shortly after arriving. At a memorial held on the 4th of April, Lieutenant Don Tully gave the eulogy, quote, The men of Delta Company knew Mac as the sort of man that would always bring a smile to your face. He was a leader, a worker, and importantly, a mate. He gave his all to the section and the platoon. He loved his job. We will remember you, Mac. You'll always be part of the team, End quote. Lance Corporal Shannon McElhaney was 21 years old. The UNITAF, UNITAF operation was essentially a stopgap designed to halt or at least reduce lawlessness in Somalia so as to allow the distribution of humanitarian aid and to provide time for a peace deal to be hammered out between the warring factions. UNITAF was to be followed by an expanded UNISOM, dubbed UNISOM 2. UNITAF handed over to UNISOM 2 on the 4th of May 1993 with an authorised strength of 28,000 plus a provision of nearly 3,000 civilian staff. UNISOM 2 was designed to continue the work of restoring security and providing aid to that deeply troubled country, but it was always plagued by numerous problems. First, it took some time to get to full strength, and by May 1993, when UNITAF left, numbered only 17,200. Even at full strength, UNISOM 2 was never as strong as UNITAF. It did not have, take long for hostile Somali elements to begin to test UNISOM 2's strength and resolve, and the violence began to increase. 160 Australians eventually served in UNISOM 2 across multiple contingents. They continued the work of the first Australian contingent who had served before and during UNITAF by coordinating the movement of personnel and thousands of tonnes of supplies, running a busy airfield and assisting in the monitoring the ceasefire between the warlords. In an indication of how busy the small Australian team was, the 4th Australian Service Contingent, for example, oversaw the movement of more than 5 million kilograms of cargo and nearly 200,000 passengers between May and November 1994. This is no mean feat given the Spartan conditions and complex nature of the deployment. As Somalia sunk back into cycles of violence and political instability, many countries withdrew from UNISOM II. Australia was one of the last countries to leave and the last ADF personnel left the country in November 1994. The Australian participation in several peacekeeping operations in Somalia constitutes some of our largest, most difficult and in most important peacekeeping operations in Australian history. In Unison 1 and 2, Australia made a meaningful contribution to two major UN operations in really difficult circumstances. UNITAF was the first battalion-sized deployment for Australia since the Vietnam War, and Australians operated in extremely difficult and dangerous conditions while they were there. Somalia is still racked by deep problems, and peacekeeping operations in that country continue to this day, but the difference that the Australians made while they were in country should not be ignored. Australian personnel helped restore, albeit briefly, security to a deeply troubled region, and assisted in the delivery of much-needed humanitarian relief. For many who served in Somalia, it was their first major deployment, and lessons learned in Somalia would have an effect on a generation of Australians deployed over the coming decades. Many are rightly proud of their service. Others remain deeply affected by the difficult things they saw and encountered along the way, and we should acknowledge that too.
Bob Breen, who has written a lot about the deployments to Somalia, including the relevant chapters of the official history, published a book on the subject called A Little Bit of Hope. And this is perhaps an appropriate way to summarise Australian operations in Somalia. Problems remain, but while the Australians were there, they managed to provide a little bit of hope, and they made a difference, and that's what counts. Well, thank you very much, Dave, for sharing all that information with us. It was really fascinating. I think um, something that strikes me about Somalia is that it's not that far removed from the present day, and so it's great for you to be able to share some insights with us. Pleasure. I've got a couple of little questions that have come to mind during your presentation. So many people who maybe don't know that much about Australian involvement in Somalia may have at least seen the movie Black Hawk Down. Um, was this something that happened when the Australians were there or, or were Australians involved? What can you tell us? Uh, the, the, the famous or infamous Black Hawk Down incident happened in October 1993. So not during that UNITAF deployment, which was when the 1RER battalion group were there, but there were Australians in country at the time serving in Unisom 2. It was a really tragic uh, incident in which uh, Black Hawk, American Black Hawk was shot down and 13 American personnel were killed. Um, but Australians were involved because in the aftermath, um, there were five unrecovered American bodies. Um, the Americans wanted to get those bodies back, but the, the warlords who had control of them um, basically didn't want Americans involved in that process. So they insisted that it would be small teams of just two UN people would go out in a vehicle. Um, they were asking for huge sums of money. Um, and the Australians were in, a small number of Australians were involved in that process of getting, uh, bringing back those bodies. And it was a very distressing uh, aspect of the service because... Um, you know, they'd been involved in a battle and it was a, um, a pretty pretty difficult time and place to be for those Australians. Yeah, that would have been very difficult to see indeed. Yeah. And as well, I was thinking that uh, you mentioned that the last Unisom 2 personnel left Mogadishu in late 1994, but I couldn't help but notice at the start of your talk that you said Australians were in Somalia until 1995. So have, have I missed something there? No, very keen I am. Um, <laughs> yes, so the last uh, Australian Defence Force personnel left in late 1994, but there are actually two Australian Federal Police in Somalia um, until early 1995. Um, there were Superintendents Bill Kirk and Barry Carpenter, who'd actually just been serving in a different peacekeeping operation in Cambodia, uh, and then were brought over to Somalia to try and um, establish a local police force and do the great work and continue the great work they were doing. But um, alas, the, uh, the, peace, the, the police aspect of that operation, and this is as Unison 2 was winding up, um, was never uh, quite well funded and given enough support um, and one of them left in late 1994 but one stuck around till about I think February 1995 before coming home so yeah we were there until 1995 albeit in, in very small numbers. Oh okay interesting interesting little tidbit there yeah okay and um, on that note I suppose can you tell us a little bit about how Australians who were involved in Somalia have been recognised over time? So those who served in UNISOM 2 and UNITAF, so that's um, the 1RER Battalion Group and, and Associated Units, um, and the, the second, third and fourth contingents of UNISOM 2, um, were uh, eligible for a Australian Active Service Medal with the Somalia CLASP. But uh, perhaps importantly and timely, um, as we record just this week, it's been announced that um, all Australians who served in um, UNITAF, as well as the four contingents of UNISOM 1 and 2, um, and those who were in HMS to Brook a bit to be awarded a meritorious unit citation, which is a, a really well-deserved and fitting recognition of um, everything they did on this series of very difficult uh, deployments. Absolutely, that's wonderful news indeed. Well, thank you so much, Dave, for sharing that information with us. It's been a really fascinating presentation. And thank you to everyone for tuning in at home. Our next webinar will be in July 2023, when we will speak to Professor Christine Helliwell, winner of the 2022 Les Carlyon Literary Prize and author of Semut, the untold story of a secret Australian operation in World War II Borneo. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>